Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation of Modern Mondays. It's part of this year's Doc Fortnight 2017. My name's Kathy Brew, and I'm the guest curator of the series. And of, thank you. Um, I'm very, very pleased tonight that we have this program because, after all, we're in 2016. And, um, oh, 17, right? Sorry. <laughs> I'm in a time warp already. Um, and clearly, um, artists who are working in nonfiction documentary are also investigating other forms and have been actually for quite some time. 20 years ago, actually, I was the director of a new media arts initiative that was part of the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. So I've been paying attention to this for quite some time. And I've been very aware of the National Film Board of Canada and the work they've been uh, helping produce and present out into the world um, interactive documentaries, VR projects, augmented reality projects. And so I thought it was very important to include an evening that would address that and give an, a sample of some of that kind of work. Um, before we start, I want to get a sort of sense in the audience. Um, how many of you would say that you're actually makers who are working in some form with media and or new media? Okay, and how many of you are just interested viewers and would like to know more about this? And how many of you are aware of some of these new media forms like virtual reality and augmented reality? And Okay, so <laughs> great. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Oog Sweeney and Rob McLaughlin in a minute. They're the uh, directors of the digital studio at NFB. Um, or executive producers, I might not be saying the title right, they'll tell you that. But I also want to raise your um, attention to the fact that in the film lobby, as you come in every day, and hopefully you'll keep coming um, for the next, till Sunday, there's a, an artwork in one of the vertical screens that's part of Doc Fortnite that's by artist Julia Hayward, who's here in tonight's audience. But on Saturday, the night of our closing night film, we're going to bring her up as the short before the feature so she gets the opportunity to engage a little bit with an audience since her work is out there. But please pay attention. It's a 24-hour piece. It changes every hour. And it's definitely worth seeing, and it comes out of total nonfiction, um, which she's filmed outside her bedroom window down in Tribeca with all these different film shoots that go on in her alley. So please welcome Rob and Yug, and they're going to drive us through some really interesting work, and we'll come back up afterwards for some Q&A with them and all of you. So thanks for being here. One new message. So I'm Rob, out of the Robin Hood, by the way, and this is a piece that we produced in 2009, and it, like I it said, it's called Please Call Very Sentimental. Uh, Alicia Smith paired photos from a flea market that she found with postings on Craigslist for people who lost their mobile phones, if you couldn't read that, 
uh, each of the postings is a plea for the return of the device, uh, not because of the phone itself, but because of the pictures that it holds. Uh, the first picture of newborn babies, pets no longer around, the last images of a father at their funeral. Uh, and as an artist and storyteller, she's really asking us to think about what it means to have our collective memories stored on these expendable sort of plastic devices, memories that in the past we've risked, you know, fire and flood to save. And we thought we would start with this uh, small piece of interactive video, not because it's uh, necessarily the most ambitious or the most acclaimed of the 80 or so pieces we've produced over the years, but because it embodies three of the predominant themes that we've uh, addressed in our work as producers. Uh, the first is that uh, we're always asking ourselves how we can explore the creative application of today's you know, internet, mobile, and other emerging technologies in the actual production of story and art. The second theme is, or the second question we ask is how do these technologies and stories then change how we think about ourselves and our communities? And that third one is, uh, how can we use these technologies to develop and sustain an ongoing uh, relationships uh, with our audience, or in our case, as a public producer, the public? And really, that's the kind of exploration uh, that's always been part of the NFB uh, since its launch in 1939. So who in the room already knows about the NFB? If I can see you. Uh, it's a light yeah, light. OK. Um, so yeah, so the NFB is a pub public producer. It's been, ah, I'll ask the question again. Uh, but I think I have the proportion. OK. Oh, quite a lot then. OK. So um, we've been there since 1939, public producer. We're not a grantor. We're not uh, there to fund. We're there to a creative producer. And the uh, mission of the NFB is to uh, bring reflection and a sense of engagement in today's uh, society. There's been over 14,000 pieces uh, of art, let's say, that came out of the NFB, mostly documentary animation. But it's always been a profoundly uh, innovative place. That's where IMAX was born. That's where the first uh, direct. That's where direct cinema was born. That's where the first film animation film made on a computer uh, was was made. And a lot of animation techniques uh, from the grandfather uh, Norman McLaren inspired Pixar and a, a lot of animation uh, makers today. And in 2009, we made a digital shift. And we decided to go and dedicate 25% uh, of our production to interactive production. So it's not the NFB website or the website of the film. It's really about thinking how can we create from uh, an interactive platform, maybe a website, a mobile, tablet, public space, VR, AR, et cetera. Yeah, so we're going to show you a sample of our work tonight, uh, some of it old and some of it new. Uh, and we'll talk about the creative approaches briefly, but then you can ask questions for you makers in the room. And uh, what I'll just point out here, if you haven't seen it already, is a lot of these are simply screen recordings of websites that we built or other kind of browsing experiences, so that's why you'll see the cursor. So look for that as clues to what's, to what's happening. And this first one is a very early interactive uh, experiment where the network itself or the internet became or we tried to make it part of the story. houses we live in, the market, the economy, currency, how many trees we're going to cut, how many fish we're going to catch. Those things human beings can manage and control because we create them and do them. But some things are facts of life. We have to live with the speed of light, gravity, uh, entropy, the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Those are things that we have to accept and work ourselves around.
And there is another one that is absolutely crucial. It's a mathematical reality called exponential growth. If something is growing at 1% a year, it'll double in 70 years. 2% a year, it'll double in 35 years. 3% a year in 24 years. 4%, 17 and a half years. Anything growing exponentially will double in a predictable length of time. Now I'm going to show you why all of this stuff about we got to keep growing, keep the economy growing, we've got to keep everything growing is ultimately suicidal. I'm going to give you a system analogous to the planet and that's a test tube full of food for bacteria. So the test tube and food is the planet and the bacteria are us. Now I'm going to introduce one bacterial cell in and it's going to divide every minute. That's exponential growth. So at time zero, at the beginning, there's one cell. One minute, there are two. Two minutes, there are four. Three minutes, there are eight. Four minutes, 16. That's exponential growth. And at 60 minutes, the test tube is completely packed with bacteria and there's no food left. So we have a 60 minute growth cycle. When is the test tube only half full? Well, of course, the answer is at 59 minutes. Even though it's been chugging along for 59 minutes, it's only half full, but one minute later, it'll be completely filled. So that means at 58 minutes, it's 25% full. 57 minutes, it's 12.5% full. At 55 minutes of a 60-minute cycle, it's 3% full. At uh, 55 minutes, one of the bacteria says, hey, guys, I've been thinking, we got a problem. We got a population problem. The other bacteria would say, Jack, what the hell have you been smoking, man? 97% of the test tube's empty and we've been around for 55 minutes. And they'd be five minutes away from filling it. So say bacteria are no smarter than humans. At 59 minutes, they go, oh my God, Jack was right. We got one minute left. What are we gonna do? Well, don't give any money to those economists that are saying we gotta keep growing all the time. Uh, give it to those scientists. So they massively inject money into the scientific community. And guess what? In less than a minute, those bacterial scientists invent three new test tubes full of food. That'd be like us finding three more planets that we could use. What happens? At 60 minutes, the first test tube's full. 61 minutes, the second's full. 62 minutes, all four are full. By quadrupling the amount of food in space, we buy two extra minutes. Our home is the biosphere. It's fixed and finite, it can't grow. And we've got to learn to live within that finite world. Every scientist I've talked to agrees with me. We've already passed the 59th minute. So you can just drop the audio down a bit and I'll talk over this, this next piece. So essentially it's an interactive story about the test tube from Canada's most famous scientist, David Suzuki, about the problems of growth and consumption. It pulls live data from Twitter based on what you answered to the question. If you had an extra minute right now, what, what would you do? And then it takes that data and populates it with all the uh, accounts from Twitter doing what you said you would do in that exact moment. It then also visualizes all the responses to the site and gives you another sort of global or internet look at uh, you know the things that we do and the things that we consume and kind of adds to the overall experience. We did this screen capture just shortly after it launched, and since then there's been a couple hundred thousand people enter, in, uh, enter their choices into the site, and I can say that the uh, thing we all want to do the most is have a quick nap. The, first, the top one is sleep. Speaking of which, when, um, so in 2009, we had our first child, and that was the moment I entered the NFB, so we had to also start new projects. And I was uh, responsible for transporting the baby for breastfeeding at any hour of the day. So in the middle of the night, I was just looking at the ceiling, and I was thinking like, so how many people are doing exactly the same thing as me, like right now? And Insomnia is a real um, is a real mental health uh, problematic. Um, it's the same uh, in any developed country, and the particularity of it is that it's a very solitary experience, but lived by many people at the same time. So I was like, probably the internet is the best, um, let's say, medium to tell that story.
My first memory of insomnia is running down the stairs at my parents' house when I was six years old and telling them I couldn't sleep and them telling me to go back to bed. But it wasn't like the other kids. It was, I honestly couldn't sleep. under the cover of darkness, I have been meeting them and collecting their stories. Welcome to a journal of insomnia. Only by making an appointment and coming back tonight will you receive the full experience. It's your turn now to invest part of your night. Like if a uh, test tube, the um, My name is Sarah. I... the um, the content was the internet. Then the content became on this project the insomniac themselves. So we collected thousands of testimonials all around the planet, and um, it was launched here uh, in New York during the the Storyscape, edit, uh, a part of the Tribeca Festival. And so we created this room where people would come in and they would answer Insomnia's question in real time with other people. And we realized it was interesting because it's this room that was built that became kind of a distorted place where you really had to crawl inside, a bit claustrophobic. But what you did in real time answering Insomnia's question was shown on the walls of the installation so and became sort of a performance. It was interesting bringing the idea of documentary in a performing mode where the audience itself, the Insomniac, would become, uh, well, yeah, the, the, the performer. Um, What's interesting also on the on one other on the other side of the uh, installation, we had uh, we projected tweets that came real time, uh, insomniacs just tweeting about their insomnia. So, but each time we receive a new uh, tweet about insomnia, it would trigger a note. So it became the melody of the project. So we had kind of this in the background in real time. Um, the insomnia always there breathing. So it's a bit like internet is like the insomnia, insomnia is like the internet. So it was interesting because it started as a website, uh, became an installation, and it ended up in the um, Fine Arts Museum in Quebec program uh, in, uh, for a month. So it was quite interesting to see uh, our project kind of uh, goes through that uh, life cycle. Yeah, so more about the network. Um, you know, they, they connect people, they connect data, and they also put us at a specific place on the planet. So this next one is an interactive photo essay. Again, fairly simple in its concepts, but what it does is geolocates the user and gives distances of the user to God's Lake uh, Narrows, which is an Indian reserve in Canada, and then it gives a distance to the uh, nearest Indian reserve uh, to where they are on, in, on the planet, or or in Canada anyways, and then places that information uh, into the context for the intro of the story.
<laughs> Whoever phoned for a whole pizza at Lorraine Trout's phone back? Uh, got this evening events. Blindfold, pillow fight, lost and found shoelace. Wider Kapalum head busting coed. Chain, chain game open. Musical chairs open. Twist contest coed. Chicken contest ages 14 to 17 coed. Permit sale at Katie Nazi, 6 o'clock. Leslie Anderson taxi at the airport for Billy Okma. Um. Paul Duck phone or go to the band office. Wants to have gospel church. Sorry. Or also so uh, this is a piece, of course, that's about perspective, but really it's also about access. And in order to see the inside of uh, the homes there in this photo, so you have to listen to what Kevin has to say first, read his words, click through the outside, and then uh, you're allowed to kind of go into the more inti intimate parts of the community and see inside uh, people's homes. Simple concepts again, but important to experiment, experiment with. And, and Kevin was really able to challenge the user, and that's how it was articulated, that uh, he had to, you had to be, you had to be uh, brave in saying, you know, no, you don't get to see the rest unless you commit to the first part. And we think that relationship uh, of audience to artist ultimately changes how we uh, come to understand certain stories. And in this case, we hope it has something to do with the issue of uh, federally funded housing on Indian reserves in Canada. So speaking about pulling audiences in, um, one project that was that really put the audience in the center of the process was Do Not Track, and it's a project about tracking online, tracking your data, tracking your behavior, and what happens um, when about your own behavior and your own data uh, when you go on social network, on your mobile, on the internet. <laughs> We've all got our addictions. We've all got our routine. Mine is to wake up, get caffeine, and go online. A little bit on a desktop, a bit on my phone. Over the morning, I give away gigabytes of information about myself, and I give it without being asked. This is my name. This is where I live. This is me on Twitter, and these are my photos. All this I share out of habit, I guess it's also part of the routine. Some would even call it an addiction. But there's a lot that I share without knowing it, and so do you. For instance, I know right now that this is the country you live in. I know that it's a shitty afternoon. I know that you're on a Mac. These are things I know just from where you're accessing this website before the day even gets started. So let's start the day. Part of my everyday routine is to see what the world is doing. Tell me where you go to get your news. The blue dot that you are seeing represents the site you are visiting right now. The red dots represent third parties who are notified each time you visit that site. Some of these third parties are called trackers, an ecosystem of data collection agencies that compare where you are on the web right now to where you've been before. And each time you browse, they learn more about you. Let's go back to my day. Now I'm distracting myself from work by looking for something funny. What about you? Where do you go for laughs? So it goes like that for six episodes. And, uh, but the, the idea is really to bring personali personalization of the, the user uh, behavior and data in real time into the documentary approach. The other thing I think what's important for us uh, that that project kind of shows is that we're, we're trying to look for subject uh, and thematics and stories that are making visible to the eye something that is invisible. Ch things that are profoundly changing the world we live in. Um, but we don't really access, we don't really understand, and not, um, how can I say, un uh, underground or marginal uh, phenomenon, but profound uh, mass phenomenon 
that are changing not the world not for a hundred years from now, but in five, six, seven years from now. Today we're going to talk about big data and exactly what it is. Let's define big data. Big data. Big data is everywhere. The ongoing joke about big data is that it's more data than your organization knows how to deal with. I think it's extremely difficult for all of us to be aware of just how much data we're producing every day and just how revealing it is. Data don't speak for themselves, and for a lot of people who don't understand big data, that's what they think. The problem is that anyone can ask any question of this data and that answer will be revealed. What's really risky is when we start to see that as the whole story and then start to make discriminatory assessments based on those activities. All right. Um, next few are all about interface, really, and it's a very important part of the work we do here. Uh, and early on, it was all about video and how do we use interact video to kind of give a sense of uh, perspective, but certainly in a documentary landscape as well, and this was the attempt in this piece. Balsalvas. <laughs> Some will not when by themselves. Some will not when speaking to children or animals. S some will not when they sing. What is the utterance? Phonemes flounder, briquette warmth, tethered to seven mollusks, an osteoblast chomps into the burger of kelp's wreck, an osteoclast nibbles a puffin's scapula in mid-afternoon wait. Each webbed foot tussles the soft hum of slipper on hardwood floors. On my way to kayaking lessons, when I was about 15, I was increasingly more nervous about uttering my name to the kayaking instructor. I remember sitting in the back of my, of my parents' car. I would try to get a particular get rhythm of a song into my head and practice it in my mouth, like <laughs> Jordan, <laughs> Jordan. If I sing, right, or if I hum before speech, it really calms the stutter. It reduces it to a to a level where I can often communicate without without social um, awkwardness. I finally got to the pool. Um, I can see the kayaking instructor and all of the rest of the kids going up to her and sort of very f fluently uh, saying their names, very envious of this. I approached her and she was quite a lot older than me in, in a really gorgeous red swimsuit. The din of noise in the, in the pool was all kind of clattering around in my head so I was forgetting the actual rhythm and I of of this of the song to hum out my words and I look up at her and she says what's your name what are you here for and I said and that was it and she started to look at me um, with 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 sympathy which is always what I can't deal with it, makes it worse for me. We just stood locked with each other, with my jaw stumbling back and forth, until finally I reached over, 
grabbed her pen and just checked my, checked my name. So you can just drop the sound a bit here? What is Way down. the yeah. utterance? So in Club and Utter, the audience is essentially responsible for the view of the performance. Uh, and the artists want us to consider our own reaction to Jordan's work, both as an audience member looking at the performer, thinking about the movement of his mouth, and also as Jordan, the performer, looking out to the audience and seeing the reaction there. They also encourage us to explore and uncover the meanings of the words found in his poetry through those documentary elements embedded in the script. And we think it hopefully creates a nice little package that, that helps explore the issue and understands Jordan, helps us understand Jordan's work a little better. Another project that we wanted to share, uh, to show, um, that, that put a lot of thought into the interface is a project called Way to Go. It's by the artist uh, Vincent Morissette that you probably know as the, the guy who created the first interactive video clips of the band Arcade Fire and the most recent, uh, which is uh, Reflector. So this is, this is a project about moving into space. So how do we uh, behave when we go from one place to another? Um, we have the tendency to follow the same paths every day, going to work or going to school or going back home. And, but what if you change your path? What if you decide to move slower or move faster? How you, will you see things differently? Will you encounter somebody that you will have not necessarily uh, encountered? Like, what does it mean in an age where technology makes you able to know exactly where you are at any given time and give you um, a direct uh, relationship with any other place on the planet? What does it mean just to get lost and try to find a, a sense of, uh, of uh, space and time? So this project was really thought about, since it's about space, it's a, a 360 full dome uh, video capture with uh, uh, imaginated layer on top of it. It was, um, the production started um, a year before the first uh, Oculus uh, VR presentation kind of started to come out. So. Um, we decided to do two versions of it, one in the web browser as a basic desktop experience and the other one as a VR experience, so it was a VR by accident. VR by accident. Uh, they don't happen by accident, really, they don't, but anyways. Uh, you know, even simply clicking through narratives, I think, can make them feel different than if you just sat back and experienced a linear story. I think they sometimes make them feel deeper or bigger or richer. This uh, next piece was initially supposed to be a book. It wasn't supposed to be anything other than that at all. And then it became this. Oops. <laughs> Backspace 10. Pine Point was the first place I ever went alone. I was nine, living in Yellowknife, and went there for a hockey tournament. I don't remember much. The 45 minute plane ride, those giant propellers, the rink's blue lobby, and that's about it. This isn't the plane. My team's not on it. But it is Pine Point around the time I was there. My family left the North when I was 10. 
who moved to Virginia, and I became that kid who got A's and F's. The guy who didn't look forward to the day things would change. My name is Mike Simons. One night last year, I went online to see what had become of Pine Point. Turns out, Pine Point isn't there anymore. Really? The website I found was called Pine Point Revisited. This is what it looks like. Plenty of images of people and enormous trucks, big holes in the ground. It was a mining town. This isn't Facebook. The photos have scratches, wrinkles, and dust. They reminded me of my own family album. My dad died in 1999. When I try to picture him, I don't see him. I see photos of him. Though I had only stayed a short while in the actual town of Pine Point, I spent hours going through its memorial. The site was the least disingenuous thing I had seen in a long time. Looking in, it's hard not to think that it was a great time to be alive and up north, in a time before seatbelts and sunscreen, when you could still pull block-long wheelies without fear of consequence. The pictures are impossibly friendly. Even the colors and textures seem unselfconscious. Wood paneling, perms, velour, deep shag. The mine closed in 1987. Most industry towns, after losing their purpose, attempt resurrections, or just slowly wither away. In Pine Point, they decided to erase the town from the face of the earth. By the following year, almost everything had been hauled away, buried, or burned. Even the arena where they held their winter carnivals, home to my last little flickering memory, gone as though it never was. This place was planned in some other place. Pine Point had none of the organic growth of most towns, where things morphed to fit trends and tides of people. Instead, it was Economics 101. A. Build a town. B. Fill it with things that towns need. And C. Let the people live. If you mounted a social experiment on the creation of hometown memories, it would probably look something like the town of Pine Point, isolated in an unforgiving landscape and built with a singular purpose. In the end, it was left standing just long enough for a single generation to run through it. Cougar. I mean, it's My name is Kimberly Fedorov. I lived in Pine Point from 75 to 84. Kim Castle had a job at the mine. But that's not what she's remembered for. Kim was the latest hairstyle, the newest dance moves, the eyeshadow and attitude of a wider world. She didn't need to know that Pine Point would one day shut down to know that she wasn't there to stay. In the meantime, though, even the smallest town needs some glamour. Psychotic, athletic, a bully. By his own admission, Richard was a piece of work. Bully is the first word he uses to describe his teenage self. Every Pine Pointer I met remembers him. He pushed around one of the brothers and dated the beauty. He was an athlete, a woodsman, a ladies' man. The guy you fear, loathe, and wish to have as a friend. Join the gym and everything. Then I got big, big, big. Kim went on to fulfill her yearbook prophecy, ambition to be a social worker. She still sings, though the costumes are archived in a tickle trunk in her basement. Her recollections of Pine Point are less quick to surface, but when they do, they're mostly happy. Richard remains larger than life. He has mellowed and come to terms with his new self. Just before leaving Pine Point, he found out that a pile of accumulating symptoms added up to the early stages of MS. He has no regrets or anger, though he's now a man who lives at the whim of schedules, lists, restrictions, 
It has focused him in other ways. Being from Pine Point has become one of his most vital characteristics. Richard loves the town. Maybe more than anything else in his life. So I just want to point out, if, uh, if you haven't seen the website, there is no audio narration in the website. We included it here as a way to sort of demonstrate, because it's hard to read uh, when we show it in theater settings. So please, if you haven't seen the website, uh, go check it out, because uh, uh, the story is quite lovely to read and explore at your own pace. And really, we show it here as a way to show the importance, again, of that interface in all of, it, in all of our work, and in simple forms. This notion of clicking and exploring does sort of make a very classic structure of the disappearance of a community with some really strong characters uh, come to life. Um, I just got, uh, sorry. Right, our challenge uh, from Pine Point is of course that uh, all devices don't work the same way and with phones and tablets, the interface also needs to change to support uh, the physical touch. So again, iPhones or uh, your uh, tablet. The next story that I'll show you, I'll just tell you what the story is because there's not enough time to, to give you the sense visually, but it's about Pitt, a draft dodger from the Second World War who hid out for four years in a cabin in the woods of Quebec and would for each successive year uh, after that, uh, up until 2012, head back to that cabin and hunt every year as a way to give thanks for the life uh, he felt he was allowed to have. His grandson, Alexi, joined him on his last trip to the woods and helped create this interactive, illustrated uh, photo journal. Uh, we think it's an intimate story and one that is uniquely supported by a touch interface. So thinking about how technology and platform bring um, story to life, this is a project called The Unknown Photographer. It's our first uh, VR native project that we released at the National Film Board. And it's about hundreds of pictures that, would found, that were found by a teenager in an abandoned house in the northern, uh, north of uh, Montreal. And the more they, they, they searched, they, they, these were all first uh, World War pictures and the more they, they start to find who that person was, the less they could uh, identify him. So we kind of tried to pay tribute to an unknown photographer and try to enter his head at the last hours of his life and have him, having him going back in time and uh, recollecting uh, those pictures. I am now a very old man. I spend more time in the world of the dead than in that of the living. I remember the war. My memories are distorted. My thoughts are a deafening cacophony. The album. 
my album. I hadn't flipped through it in so many years. But it's always there in my memory. I hold on to it. I would have filled it with all the images I took during World War I. I was a very young man. So the way that you see the, the lady going through the experience uh, with the movement of her head, but you, uh, the person also controls with a, a small uh, controller, controls the, the movement going forward and uh, moving into the space. Um, one particularity of that project is that the person who came with us with the, these photographies is a photographer. He already made a book, he already made uh, an installation, he wanted to make a film. And one of our challenges as producers for this kind, for this emerging genre, if we want to call it like interactive documentary, is to uh, build teams. And so often we say that the creator is a team. It's very rarely like one person, like as a director, uh, like we would say in a film. And it's really bringing different talent and expertise and background of people who haven't worked together before. And most of the time, people who don't even know the expertise of the other. How do you make a coder, a technologist, work with a filmmaker, a musician, uh, make uh, interface uh, designers work with uh, writers or even poets? So it's a very uh, interesting and challenging balance uh, to keep in this project. For instance, this project in particular, the photographer who came with us, with that initiative, uh, and the first, um, at the beginning, uh, first stages of the production, was not there at the end of production, and for very good reason. And, but he was, he was with us, around us, but he was not in the core of the creative team anymore. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, challenge for us. Right. Um, yes, and this next one again is from 2012, 2013 in there and sort of talks about or it sort of provides clues and was early on as we started to move into this virtual physical kind of storytelling space. That snare had a breaking strength of two tons. The dart was full of something called telezol, 
brought to you by Pfizer. The same people who make so often Viagra. The next thing I know, I'm wearing a, a VHF collar and I have my own radio frequency. They also gave me a number. Bear 71. National Park in the heart of the Canadian Rockies. Bears and humans here live closer together than any other place on Earth. That explains the radio caller constantly beeping my location to some ranger playing God. There are 15 remote sensing cameras in my home range, plus infrared counters and barbed wire snags to collect my hair. I call it the grid. I live around a town called Canmore in the Bow River Valley. Now Canmore has doubled in size over the past decade and it gets five million tourists a year. It's not like I can tiptoe around it at all. I need 500 square kilometers just to find enough food to raise my cubs. People come to Banff to see what's been lost almost everywhere else. Everyone wants to see a grizzly bear, but of course, no one wants to be killed by one. There used to be this beautiful patch of bright red buffalo berries right in the campground by the firewood pile. Bear 66 and I used to sneak there. You know, when you're young and you push boundaries. The first six months after I got the radio caller, I was chased away by rangers 12 times. They call it aversive conditioning. I call it rubber bullets. Even at a distance of 100 feet, a rubber slug is still moving at 650 kilometers an hour. The rangers know where I am from the day I leave my den in the spring to the day I go back to sleep in the fall. I suppose it's like most of the surveillance that goes on today. It's partly there to protect you and partly to protect everybody else from you. So Bear 71 is the story of a bear and how we understand its environment through the collection of data and how we ultimately understand each other through the collection and display of that data. It's told through that GPS tracking device and the images and videos captured by hundreds of motion sensor cameras placed around the park and you use the grid to allow the user to explore that uh, very detailed terrain and as accurate as possible to the actual uh, space. Uh, if you haven't gone through the whole, whole story, I won't tell you how it ends. But I will point out that um, some people miss it, that there is this other layer to that interface that while you're browsing the grid, other users are also watching you uh, browse the grid through this network of uh, webcams. Uh, it is a good piece. It's considered important for this uh, area of interactive documentaries. And like many of our projects, has different versions. Uh, it had a big installation uh, at Sundance with augmented reality where users would uh, allow themselves to be tracked throughout the festival and displayed in the, uh, in the installation. And just last week we announced uh, with a partnership for Google uh, a VR version that lets you view it in your Chrome browser or through your Daydream device, so you can check that out. About uh, projects moving out of the, out of the screens, um, we're developing more and more experiences in public spaces, and one of them uh, happened in Montreal in 2013. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonsoir. Je sais
Monsieur votre maître de cérémonie, bienvenue à Megaphone. So for 40 nights during the, that season, people came and took speech. It re really was, a, it was a, during the municipal election was one of the most important uh, election in the modern history of the city. It was just after the big um, uh, uprise of students that lasted all spring. And it was really about what does it mean to take speech today uh, when we have to Facebook, through Twitter, Instagram, whatever, you can instant, instantaneously talk to um, tens or hundreds or thousands of people with no mediation or no filter. What does it mean to take speech in front of 10, 40, 50 people, 100 people looking at you physically? How does it change the way you talk? How does it change the content you talk? So it was very interesting and the, the words that were projected on the, on the university that you saw were accumulated as the nights were, uh, the days were evolving and at the end we gave the top 100 words that were said in the installation during that period and we gave them to a philosopher to interpret and he published a paper in, uh, in a daily newspaper in Montreal. So it was, it was interesting to bring that uh, perspective. Um, Another aspect also of, about bringing media and documentary out of the screen was really to try to reflect like even out of a screen itself, how does the room around you becomes the interface?
one I was thinking about the condom when I really did start fooling around is what does a person look like? How do I feel about this person? I had funny views on the condom before, before all this. I didn't, I always had them with me, but sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. In the 70s and the 80s, the, the really the condom was not really talked about. Really, we didn't think of condoms all that much. I had 48 friends. We were a group of 48 from the United States, Germany, England. We all got together once a month. I was the worst one of them all. And I'm the only survivor out of them all, and I was the oldest one of them all. All died of AIDS. All died of AIDS, and they went very quick. I can't say that, I do regret that I didn't use it, but I can't blame anybody, it's my mistake for not using the condom. Even in those days, we should have used condoms because we were really dirty. And when I say dirty, I mean dirty. Now, I really had a lot of sex in my life. I would say the majority of the time I wouldn't wear a condom. But if I was to be today, I would wear a condom. So as you, as you saw, you, you scan an object, like wherever you are in your room, supermarket, whatever, you scan an object. And so what we did, we categorized um, all the possibilities of object into 14 different categories. And there was 160 second films made by creators in uh, Canada and France. Uh, this is a co-production with Arte in France. In general, what you saw, most of our projects are made in collaboration with partners in Latin America, in Europe, in the States. Um, this, uh, I'd just like to say also that uh, one of the creators of this project is in the room. It's uh, my friend Eli from Montreal, not, now lives in uh, New York, was uh, one of the creative technologists on that project. Um, this project also became an, became an installation, so it was like, uh, man size big barcode there was hundred of objects on the floor you would pick one up scan it like at the supermarket and then the the barcode became um became the the screen and it moved in different places but very interesting one of our preoccupation is really to redefine the um, connection with the audience and the piece went in the heart of the montreal uh, subway station in the busiest subway where like every uh, morning and night there are like tens of thousands of people just commuting, so it made us in contact with a very unorthodox um, uh, audience. So these were lots of projects uh, that we did. Uh, we released over 60 projects since 2008, 2009. We have a lot of things coming up uh, this year, 2017. Um, some of them talk about the streamers community, people that play video games and film themselves uh, online through, the, through the, the platform Twitch. We're doing something about that. We're doing something about the future of e-commerce, about the, uh, also the impact of our relationship to each other under surveillance, uh, camera, uh, surveillance cameras. One project is a VR and AR uh, initiative. It's called The Enemy. It's uh, from a war photographer. His name is uh, uh, Karim Ben Khalifa, and it's an international co production, too. This project was born out of frustration as a photojournalist. I have covered conflicts for the last 15 years, and I knew I could not just do the same when I became a father. Yet, I was not done with trying to understand wars. My friend in Israel, when they know I'm heading for Gaza, cannot help themselves but to wish me luck and to stay safe. They believe a lot of people in Gaza are irrational. But also when I spend weeks in Gaza working, and I'm about to return to Israel, my Palestinian friends are telling me exactly the same. Just be careful there. So there is a bigger story than the war itself, and perhaps this is the one I need to explore and share. This project is rooted in my experience going from one side to the other in many different wars and conflicts, finding that people's dreams, hopes, and nightmares are often more similar than they are different. Who's your enemy? 
For the audience to understand and feel that, we will use artificial intelligence, cognitive science, and the latest technologies in virtual realities. Here is the concept. The Oculus Rift is a virtual reality headset. It blocks your vision and places you in a virtual world that we are created. Fox Harrell, a professor, and Emil Bruno, a researcher, both from the MIT, will provide the analytical backbone. When the audience walks in between enemies, we will measure bias and how it physiologically responds to the installation. And in using neuroscience research, we could be able to discover how much empathy has been created. I am planning to bring the fighters of seven other long-standing conflicts together in the very same way. You create an enemy as a kid without having met your enemy because the society around you has created an enemy in the other. So the question is, could I be you if I was on the other side? in Vancouver about 19 projects in various stages of production right now. We have a big project coming out in the summer which celebrates Canada's 150th anniversary which is a collection of these 13 first person stories about uh, the notion of legacy and uh, it's also a big partnership and it's a print project to be honest. It's going to go in all the major dailies across the country uh, and so the NFP again is this explorer of a range of formats is proving to be true. Uh, I have six projects uh, in VR, AR uh, areas as well, covering a range of things from issues of suicide to uh, mother and daughter having a conversation in them. And I was going to try to show some of those, and then I decided not to because I have this one, which is like an interactive comic book slash game. And uh, I'm just going to set up the clip here. It's not really factual, but I hope you like it. And it's, uh, it's going to show two gameplay elements and introduce you to the main character of this interactive comic book game thing. The character's name is Thane, who interacts with his virtual assistant, Susan. Zero Sorry to interrupt your important work. Susan! Never break my send flow state. This is crucial work. I thought you would want to see your dating profile results. Ooh, oh, these pills can wait. Time for a date with destiny. All right, ladies, who's first? I'm looking more for like muscle man with nice handsome face. My doctor tells me I'm allergic to unemployable losers, sorry! Nah, I'm gonna take a pass. Nice try, flappy face. I'm looking for more like a movie star type character. You're more like a skeleton draped in like weird wet meat. Um, my horoscope told me that I should just totally avoid men who look like a sandwich that's been left in the sun. <laughs> Oh, honey buns. You look bummed. Perhaps a can of pint cleaner will turn that frown upside down. Oh, Susan, I'm so sad. I don't even think that pint cleaner's delicious blend of hand sanitizer, antibiotics, and caffeine is enough to wash away my tears. I'm so sad! What? Too sad to drink pipe cleaner? Um, uh, oh, okay. No, no, no. Market research. Um, check the socks button. Too sad to drink. No, no, no. What is happening? So, yeah, 
Yeah, watch for that coming 2017 in very much in the uh, realm of auteur animations and our history of that in the film board as well. So you'll find all that stuff and more at nfb.ca slash interactive. So thanks for coming and we'll, with Cathy, we'll do a little chat with you if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, hello. Oh, yes, we are. So, yeah, we're up on stage tonight instead of more casual because this is being live streamed to stay with the technology here. Um, because this has been more of a presentation with these guys, I'd actually like to open it up to you all first for any comments or questions that you might have so we can be more interactive. And I see one right there. I have a question about the technology that you're using. Um, You've got a lot of legacy content because you got started a long time ago. Could you say something about our using Flash, HTML5? You mentioned Oculus. And I'm wondering, especially since you've got legacy content and every year we're seeing new types of devices, how do you handle the process of migrating old content to new technologies and new devices? Well, yeah, exactly. So. Well, that's um, like consciously when we were, when we started doing things, we knew there was like a, a, a parent, like a, a non parent, no parent. There was expiry date. We knew that, like from from from, date, from, yeah. from the get go, we knew that it was uh, so. But I think it was about like embracing the moment and the state of technology and how people use it in that particular moment. Then how we migrate this from that's a that's actually a problem of the entire like industry. So like for instance, Chrome is abandoning Flash. Like those pub, the public installation updates, like the barcode project I showed you, we need to do like an appropriate update for it to work on the new iOS, etc. So and it's a big question about um, investing money and uh, how to do it and why to do it. Does each project need to do that? So it's um, it's interesting. In in, uh, in spring, there's going to be um, a conference, an MIT conference in Montreal with the Phi Center, and it's it's called Update or Die, and it's really about that. It's preservation, and it's it it is a problematic that needs to be handled not just by the NFB, like our project are maybe like a symptom because it moves fast and yes, legacy content that is not accessible anymore. So yeah, we have to figure that out. We, forget, we figured out how to make a 35 millimeter hibernate like for 1000 year and it's not a joke. But even like uh, video content from the 70s and then like all the, the first like digital platform of like NF 70s, 80s, Lots of it is getting lost, so it's a real uh, problem. I'll just add one thing. Like in our studio in Vancouver, it is a, an emotional issue. Like for the people that work in this space and that have invested time in the projects, it's very emotional to not have a solution in place that protects their work. But I think that there's a, um, it, it's a very ambivalent thing, like how much you invest in new content versus preserving like uh, old content, because it can be very costly, like time and money costly to do so. But at the same time, there's a question of memory. Like how do we build the memory in two decades of that discipline? Like for instance, for me, like probably the first thing like I could call like interactive docu documentary, whatever, was a CD-ROM edited by Peter Gabriel and Secret World. It was about the um, uh, epistolary, epistolary mm -hmm. exchange. Does that translate in English? Yes. Okay. Exchange between two people, and it was very, a very artful, very beautiful, but it was a real exchange translated into a CD-ROM experience. Today, I cannot make a reference to that thing because it's not accessible anymore. So what does it mean for the memory of 
the, this discipline. Yeah, this has been an issue for a long time, and some people refer to it as variable media, and whether, yeah, emulation, or whether you keep the old computers, so you can still look at all of that. It, it is a huge issue, for sure. I saw a hand back there. Microphone is coming. Oh, sorry. Um, hi. I'd like to know, how do you know that a story or a documentary is um, better told in VR than in, in the classic storytelling? And the same question for interactive. How do you know this is good for interactive or for VR? You and I just gave this answer earlier today a little bit differently. I'm, uh, I'm about access. So uh, early on, I started as a journalist in the late 90s. And no one cared about the internet, so they let me do whatever I wanted on it. So for me, it was the most accessible platform. So all the kind of storytelling I did was built around that, not because it was the perfect story to tell on that. I adapted some classic stories and used links and images and sound differently. So for me, I don't think there is a perfect story, to be honest. If you have, it's about access for me, and I think you can tell a bunch of different stories a bunch of different ways on similar platforms and different platforms. So I know that's not the answer you wanted to hear necessarily because there is a lot of discussion about, well, why VR, why this, or why that? And I think technologies are so new still that you should just try to explore any way you can. And if you have access to the tools and distribution of media, then just try to capitalize on them for whatever story you want to tell. I think often you discover as you do, and then you make different decisions. Like the unknown photographer I showed, the person came with a film idea, it became like an interactive web doc, then it became like this tablet experience, then it became VR, just because iterative like trial and error thing. The other thing like, I believe too that stories can be told through like many ways, but I find also that different platform, may it be a book, a VR headset, or like a radio or whatever, all different platform have particular attributes. And it depends like what's the angle and how do you want to treat that? Do you want to make it like super intimate? Do you want to make it so? And I think like radio has a particularity and VR has a particularity and sometimes it's gonna kind of guide you where you want to go. But I think also you're even pointing out that some projects are actually presented in multiple modes yeah. simultaneously. Like you might have a web project that then is a film or you know. So there's sort of that going on too. Back here. No, you can go, go to him actually, because they already answered my question. Okay. Where was the other? There was a hand right th in this area. Whoever's hand was up, pull it up again. <laughs> um, you mentioned access uh, just a moment ago, and, and I was uh, thinking and curious about um, what, what, what I think uh, struck me the most of the presentation of the project world, megaphone and, uh, and barcode, but the, the actual live interaction of barcode in the subway, which because it's like a massive uh, place of transit and commuting and all that. So uh, yeah, like your thoughts on, on, on that and in terms of access, if you can elaborate more on like, because yeah, like the, it, it just doesn't seem for me that there's a lot of access for these projects because even though it's on the web but like who like you know like I think it's a, a sort of a minority people that will actually spend time uh, interacting on these projects uh, including myself who have a natural interest for this but like my personal experience has been that I give it a certain amount of time and then I move on and so it's always been super appealing uh, even as a creator to kind of like have those thoughts for projects, but then kind of like scratch it when I start thinking of like, who's gonna watch it, people in a gallery or like my friends on a, you know, like, anyway. So like, I guess the, the, my my question my for you is like, yeah, like if you can elaborate more on like what NFB thinks about bringing more projects like Megaphone and things like that, or, or how like to have all the projects be more accessible to all. Well, as a, we're a public institution, so we think about access maybe differently than one that's measured by pure reach. So we do projects for a bunch of different reasons, right? And we 
allocate public dollars to do that. So, you know, a thousand people versus a hundred thousand people might, uh, well, a thousand people might be more of a success than a hundred thousand people. So it is about, you know, understanding who you're speaking to and how you're speaking to them and why you're speaking to them or why you're doing projects with them or interacting with them. So it's almost case by case for me. I mean, you're absolutely right that sometimes uh, a project might not fit with who you're trying to reach because you've failed to realize the certain environment they're operating in. They don't have the time. They don't browse the web that way. They don't have a phone. They don't have the data plan. They don't have a color TV. They don't have a theater. I mean, this is just the classic trying to make sense of the media that you're producing and who you're producing it for. I think the physical stuff is awesome because it's out there. It's also exciting. It's live. I don't want to speak for Ig, but he got to talk about it a lot, so maybe I'll speak for a second about it. Like, I think it's wonderful for the film board to be in that physical space. O2 animation, POV documentary, we own that stuff. We do community screenings. We're well known. So to be outside and visible like that is really good for a public institution like, like ourselves. What yes. I said? Yes. yes. Thanks. Um, another general question, uh, kind of comparing perhaps the traditional linear documentary style and um, new media and interactive documentary. Um, what kind, broadly speaking, what kind of questions in terms of creativity and um, uh, design come up in this process? So for example, I imagine questions about the interface and how you're going to put um, the different material together. And then if I can piggyback off of that, I'm writing a dissertation about documentary sound, so if you might have anything to say about how sound might be used um, in a different way compared to kind of connecting different footage together in the traditional linear sense. Well, well, I think for, sound for me is like super important. Like uh, there was one uh, when I, uh, um, at university, there was one teacher that said that was the most powerful media because it, it, it's the most immersive because it's absolutely everything happens in your head. There's no visual support whatsoever. Like even a book that you still have this paper and the, so it's a complete experience. I think we work a lot with musicians. We try to get musicians on board like uh, as early as possible in the process to think about the pieces like the. Insomnia, um, I'm really, I'm really interested into a lot into a, a generative uh, approach to sound in interactive pieces because they're connected to what the person is doing or what's do happening in the environment. So that's why I really like what Philip brought in the, the Philip Lamba, the, the the musician Insomnia about making just he just identified like eight notes and gave them a place in the, in melody, but how the melody played out was Twitter. So for me, that's it, it's part of the story, it's part of the, uh, the narrative. Um, about the overall process, I think it's always, we're try always trying to understand like, why is it like, one of the first questions we ask ourselves from the beginning is like, why is it interactive? Like why it should be on the internet? Why is it on the internet? Why shouldn't it be a film? Why shouldn't it be a book? And some initiatives started as films ended up as interactive. Some interactive stuff started as interactive and finished as film. So it's really trying to follow the um, follow the natural path of a, of a project. And yeah, so we have the privilege, like you saw the pieces, like we're super privileged to work in a, in a space where it's all one off. Like there's no format, there's no series, we don't. We almost never repeat something. We always do something new each of the time, and it's really about trying to fit the that f form needs to take shape of content, and the two need to be equal. It's not just the internet is not just a big a big pipe to just push content through. It's the pipe is also part of the the form. It's the it's also the shape. So we're trying to try to always find that equilibrium between the two, not one of the two overtaking. So I think that uh, doesn't really answer, but it's kind of a lead through the, through, through the process. In other words, there are no templates. There's no cookie cutter here. It's, as you say, it's each project site specific to the content. I saw a question back there.
Hi, um, I was just wondering how many people are on the interactives team and how it's made up. I mean, the projects are so varied. I imagine that there are people coming from all kinds of professional backgrounds. Yeah, it's project by project. One of the things we talk about on the production side of things, and you mentioned it in the in the in his in his comments, like like it is about as producers, we are like matchmakers and team builders first and foremost, and you have to understand the skills you need to put them into place. So really, every project for me is is quite different and built almost from scratch every time. For my studio team, there's six of us. Um, I've got a couple of other producers. I've got a guy that calls himself a creative technologist. I've got a project manager, um, an administrator. It's about it. So there's six of us. We do do in in the English side. We do. Um, we don't do as many co-productions at the moment as Oog's team. Like we sort of do a lot of 100% funded uh, NFP work. Um, that might limit us in some way. But I hope to to do more co-productions in the future as well. So we work with like every project is a different team. So it's like a satellite of satellites all around the studio. So the studio's in the middle and like Rob said, he has like 16 things on the go right now. So it's like 16 different uh, teams in the, in, the, in the city, in the country. So it's very interesting. But those people aren't all on staff, so some of them are just exactly project all independent. Based, independent. Well, we and, do, and we do lean on the film board too. Like we work with other producers inside the film board sometimes, but but generally they're outside. Yeah. But creation happens outside the board, like Richard in itself, and often also it can be like a musician, a writer, and a studio. So these seven people in the studio, and we consider this entity as one of the. Uh, one of the creative team. So it's, all, it's also interesting bringing the board who has been very uh, individual based the way teams are built to matchmaking sometimes entities like that that are businesses in the, in the real world but are in a creative uh, process. Joan, you had a question down here. Well, I mean, it's, I'm a little confused here about like how you do this. So do you, is it a year's project? Do you have an artist, they apply, the artist comes there, or the artist stays where they are, and you virtually meet by Skype? Or how do you, how, and what kind of budgets do you work with? I mean, do they go more than six months or one year? And is there artist stipends, or is there like, you know, like, we spend like, half of, we spend half of our good time. what you're doing. <laughs> We spend half of the time not at the office, actually. So we spend all, a lot of time at other people's studios and office. But I think there's two tracks. Does that mean that you go, you fly to Los Angeles, or you fly to France, or you fly wherever you're going to fly to? Well, co-productions co make you fly a lot. But oh, I yeah. think that, like, there's two modes. I, I think there's, like, the, the, sh the, the, the small ones and the big ones. And the small ones cost, like, 20K. They take, like, six months to make. And they're always... An idea comes from the outside or from the outside, inside out. Like we could have, like the insomnia thing, at the basic, it was my idea. I wanted something to be made about insomnia. I gathered four different people together and I gave them the idea and the project and they became the creators of the project. So, and I think it's back and forth between that. And we have bigger projects that take 24, 36 months to make that cost like, I don't know, like one third, like um, 200K to make. And so these are the two kind of skills. And it's the thing that drives the film board crazy, right? Like, because there's nothing we do is repeatable, formatable. So even in the budgeting process, it gets, it's a bit messy, right? And it is frustrating for our administrators because we're like, well, I don't know how much time and effort. So a lot of day rate work happens, a lot of looking outside of our industry for programmers. But, the, but yeah, so it is, it's not a clean process whatsoever. Um, yeah. And I have. I'm sorry, one more question yeah. about your restoration and you know, moving your projects into the future and migrating them. Do you have like, do you separate your budgets, one's migration and, and restoration and the other one's production or do you get it, does it well, co-mingle funds and you just? Yeah, you're inside the film board now, right? So in the end, <laughs> for the films, they're not pro it's not programming dollars that protects the, the film for the future, right? It's the institution dollars that 
um, that lock it away and make sure it's so accessible. So you have archival budget. Right, there is. That's not okay. programming oh, dollars. I see. And so in, our, in our world right now, you know, we're trying to, we're making arguments that right. that shouldn't be programming dollars, right? But. Right, exactly. Right. Thank you. Way in the back. Have you worked at the film board? No, I'm just kidding. Like, <laughs> I was wondering if you worked. How do you know all this is going on? These conversations. She's the video maker. Hi. Um, I was really interested in the project, The Enemy, and was wondering what's the audience um, for a project like that. And I guess this is kind of going back to the question of access. Is it coming out weird? No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, at, for something like that, where I'm guessing that Oculus headsets aren't really readily available in Gaza, uh, who is the audience in this narrative? When you're, I got the feeling that this was some sort of conflict resolution through VR, um, but is it just for? audiences that have access to our Oculus to kind of witness this conflict? Or how do you see this playing out? So there's two, um, there's two versions of the project. There's the VR project that you saw that is like a multiplayer that needs, you need to move into a space. So it's sure that right now we're, we're trying to compare different technologies to see how we can make this as uh, exportable as possible. Uh, but yeah, we need we will need like museum partners or like organization partner to bring that in many places. But we decided to do an AR version of the project, so and that uh, try to make it as as accessible as possible on smartphones, so you can live the experience through a phone in the like Pokemon Go approach of being bringing the the, the enemies into your own space and yourself um, moving into that space. Um, to make sure that we reach the widest audience as possible with the project. Um, that being said, we're still working with different uh, NGOs or institutions to try to bring the VR installation in places that don't necessarily have the means or infrastructure to, uh, to receive that. So who would you say is the primary audience then? Like when they pitched the project to you, who did they describe their target audience as? I'm just curious. Well, it's sure that it's funny, like the, the question also about the accessibility earlier for me, the challenge is that it's um, emerging genre for emerging audience. Like we're kind of developing the audience at the same time we're developing the content, at the same time we're developing the form, the medium and the technology. And it's a weird equi equilibrium. We would like to talk a bit less about the technology and platform and more about the content and experience. But the, the reality is that it's sure that you will have like more than 50% of people who are interested, who are people that are curious about trying these new experiences, like for VR, for, for instance, or AR. So, and then I think that there's, yes, there is like, we want to bring these. Uh, this experience in places where they have conflict, but I think that there's a sense of understanding where we want to bring uh, really far from where conflicts are happening. Like, I'm Quebecois, I was uh, raised in Gatineau, I live in Montreal, it's very peaceful, like, I don't understand what's happening in Gaza, like, I don't understand why I could, yes, I read the newspaper and I read history and but to gain access to a proximity of two people that would kill each other and the motivation and like the human behind the, the, the idea of the soldier um, may help me understand a bit more something that is very, very far away from me. So we have this reflection about this project is like a, in some way we hopefully like a mass uh, audience uh, project to give access to something that most of us will never uh, live. Because isn't that one of the things that they're saying about VR is that it really helps um, invoke empathy, I think, from some of what I've So read. we had this conversation this afternoon, actually. Okay. I wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, uh, it's such a complex issue 
part, uh, there's a big part of me, so there's a voice that's saying, I hear that you want to be able to experience their conflict more closely and invoking empathy in an audience of means, money, connections, people who can provide support to those people in need is hugely valuable. Um, and and I, from, by the time your presentation had ended, I was thinking a lot about access on my own. And like, okay, you're, you've got a, like a humanitarian crisis unfolding. How do you weigh the petri dish that you're hoping to create for yourself and your com your closer community to understand what's happening? And I, I don't mean to belittle that. I, I, it's just like, I, it, I hear the, the heavy lifting of having to sort of reverse engineer a project that was VR and new tech focused so that it's accessible, but why not just like print a freaking newspaper? Or I don't know, just like if you're really thinking about accessibility, like, I don't know, just make it accessible, right? But. I, it's, it's, yep. but, but at the same time, it's, it's a multi-layered issue because you're, you're working in technology that later down the line may make news and information like, so right, and that's you have to take a risk yeah. and We're I, and I applaud you for that. the early phase of it, right? I mean, and, but as yeah. much as we all don't have, you know, headsets, we, you can get those Google Cardboard things and look well, at... Well, we can. Right, but I mean, a lot more people can and probably more yeah. and more as and it keeps... Definitely more and more. But it's a great it's a great point. And I mean, in the end, you have to have show discipline and rigor around understanding why you're doing the project and who you're doing it for. Yeah. And you must have good answers for that period, no matter what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? If you're an advocate, I always find it interesting when I talk with with uh, people who advocate or uh, an activist that wants to change the world, and they come and talk to me about creating media. And I'm like, are you sure this is right? And these are the so conversations hard. we have with those non-media makers as well. So it is about. Like you said, being honest and being smart with, with you know, what you're trying to achieve. This one is tricky because it's really someone that made, you know, Karim covered like all major conflicts of the 90s. And yeah. And add with already. like photography and newspaper. Yeah. And then add a child and said like, okay, so I need to make decision here about my life. Okay. So how can I make this reflection move forward? And it's really tricky because for us, if I just come back to the like what the NFB is, is about to bring reflection and sense of engagement. Like we're not like an NGO or like, but this project touches such a sensible like chord that it's like, yes, but still we're a public service like in Canada. So how do we bring like, how, how, how are we relevant into thinking of our world for Canadians and then we have French co-producers, so for French audience too. So that's tricky, and Karim is really like, no, we need to bring the installation in Gaza. We're like, yes, <laughs> yeah. okay, so how are we going about, yeah, how do we go way. about this, yeah. Yeah, very cool, very cool. I mean, it's a potent project, so I applaud you for it. Do we have any other questions out there? Can't see with the light. Yes, way in the back. And then, Candace. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> this will be our last question. So. Hi, 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 Oog. Um, thank you both. Uh, I have a question about how, how often do you guys have um, kind of a comment section on these projects or kind of user input, and how do you guys, being small teams, go about kind of managing? Uh, that input. I mean, I don't know if you guys have trolls, et cetera, and how you kind of deal with that sort of stuff. So you kind of are about evaluation of projects in a way, um, feedback? More just like when you have a project up and it's going and people are putting input into it, do you guys have to constantly manage kind of what you're getting back? Yes, sometimes, and sometimes it's the internet and it just happens the way it it happens sometimes, but so we have budgeted and used third-party moderation services in order to make sure we're not uh, harming someone through some input of data or comments or other pieces of media. So we have done that. It goes into the the budgeting process, right? And we try to be smart about that. Um, sometimes we're good, and sometimes we're not so good at that. But yes, there is. Uh, it's case by case for for us usually. 
the funny thing, like the more you're the, and that was the big lesson, like the insomnia, we try from the beginning, we tried some user generated content in the project and it was often was like, we do this piece and what's your part? Like always afterwards. And what we tried with insomnia, just to reverse the thing and start with the people. And we realized that the more you're specific about the ask, the better the output is, and the less you'll have these graffitis on, on the bathroom walls kind of things. And like the insomnia thing, we realized that like we use like almost 90% of what came in. Usually you use like 10% of what comes in. But because we treated the audience uh, almost like as um, uh, you know, comedians on the, on the stage, like giving very specific ask and, and, uh, and playground, um, they would deliver because if I, I think it was not interesting for Troll probably to be there because it was too too specific or too close. We don't That's have any. Learning. I don't think we have any stories where it went horribly wrong yet, like where something yeah, disastrous yet. happened. Well, that's a pretty good record. <laughs> so on that note, I want to thank you both for being here and all of you. Thanks for coming tonight. Yeah, thank you. Yep.